Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and this is a free one hour tutorial on how to use your new Nikon D750. Let's get started. This is a long tutorial, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. There's a description in the uh, down below here. So look at the description. You can jump forward because I'm probably going to cover some stuff that you already know, but I bet you there's some new stuff you don't have in, you don't already know, especially the gear recommendations for accessories like lenses and flashes and stuff. If you want to check out our full inventory of tutorials, maybe you have a friend who has a camera and you want to send them to a similar tutorial, visit sdp.io slash tutorials. It's not just cameras, but soon you'll see plenty of drone and smartphone videos in there too. Maybe even by the time you see this, they're already there. I'm not going to cover everything, uh, just the stuff that I think is most core to photography. So I'm not going to go over the retouching menu on this because I figure if you're doing retouching, you're probably using a computer or your smartphone, but you probably aren't really doing it on the camera. Otherwise, I cover most of the stuff you need to know. First of all, let's go over assembling the camera. I bet you already got this. You'll have to, of course, put the battery in. The way you'll do that, you'll put the little humps forward, make sure the metal contacts are facing in towards the camera, and you'll slide it in until it clicks. When you're ready to take the battery back out, you'll push that little yellow tab there, and a spring will pop it out. Make sure you close this, and it should stay firmly attached. I highly recommend you getting an extra battery just because the battery can last all day. It can even go a couple of days. If I'm taking a weekend trip, I might just fully charge a battery and never have to change it. However, you don't want to be stuck with no batteries. It's always good to have a second battery and keep it fully charged with you, even if you don't travel with your charger. Here's a link that will give us a few pennies of, of your purchase, helps to support us, that will get you the original Nikon battery. I do not recommend getting one of the third-party generic batteries. They work great for a few weeks maybe even six weeks. That's why you'll see all these great reviews. But over time, they lose capacity and total capacity very quickly. And in our experience with lots of different brands, at some point, they will suddenly die and leave you stranded. And for a pro-level body like this, you really can't tolerate that. So I don't recommend getting it. If you open up the compartment on the side here by sliding it back, you'll reveal the memory card ports. There are two of them. These are SD cards. You'll insert your SD cards by pushing it in all the way until it clicks. When you're ready to take it out, you'll just push it again and it will pop right out. Um, be careful not to like just flick your finger across it or, or it's likely to go just flying out. When you're ready to close it up, you'll push this closed and then snap that in until it stays in place. When pictures are actually being written to the SD card, you'll see this little light here light up. Okay. If you're shooting landscapes, if you're shooting slowly, you can use any SD card. I highly recommend just getting a big and inexpensive SD card. That should be fine. Visit stp.io slash SD to see a list of just inexpensive SD cards. Um, a 64 gig or 128 gig SD card is not too big for this. I like to just be able to leave one SD card in there and go for a whole week of vacation and not have to worry about unloading them. But uh, I also strongly recommend uh, getting two SD cards. When you have two SD cards, you can write to both cards simultaneously. SD cards do occasionally fail. Even the pro high-end ones will fail. We've seen it happen quite a few times. Therefore, if you write to both cards and one of them fails, you still have a backup and you haven't lost all your pictures, especially if you're shooting somebody's wedding. That's really vital, right? So always write to two SD cards when you can. I'll show you how to configure the camera to write to both SD cards. After you've put two cards in, hit the menu button here. Then you'll go over to the camera icon and you'll scroll down to roll played by card in slot two and then scroll to the right with the directional pad here. You can see you can choose between overflow, which will fill up the first card and then start writing to the second card, but only makes one copy of each. You can also do backup, which writes the same file format to both cards simultaneously. And your third option is raw slot one, JPEG slot two. We'll talk about raw versus JPEG in a little bit, but the reason you'd use raw slot one, JPEG slot two is mostly if you have one big fast card in slot one, and then maybe like a cheaper, smaller card in slot two, like a 256 gig card and then a 16 gig card. If you wanted to make sure they filled up at about the same pace, writing JPEGs to the second card would reduce the space required. Now, if you're shooting sports or something, the speed of the SD card is gonna become really important to you because this camera will shoot fairly quickly and it will fill up the buffer, which means that once you shoot continuously, let's, let's just shoot here real quickly. Okay, 
see how that was fast and then it slowed down really quickly? Instead of shooting at that higher frame rate, it's shooting at a low frame rate now because it filled up its buffer. The buffer is the storage space in between the camera sensor and the SD card. And it can write a whole bunch of pictures really fast into this high-speed buffer, but then the SD card itself is much slower. Therefore, the time it takes before the camera starts buffering when it shoots slower depends on how quickly the camera can write from its buffer to the SD card. If you have a really slow SD card, that unloading process is going to be slow. If you're shooting landscapes, it doesn't really matter, but if you're shooting sports, it can matter tremendously. Uh, therefore, a faster SD card allows those pictures to um, unload from the buffer faster and allows you to take more pictures quickly. The fastest SD card, I've seen different people test this independently. The fastest SD card is one of our favorites anyway, the SanDisk Extreme Pro. It's a UHS-1 card. This camera supports you as UHS-1. It does not support UHS-2, so you can use the UHS-2 cards, but you won't see any benefit. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. Uh, you can just use this link here, sep.io slash sepsd, and uh, that will take you to Amazon where you can buy those Extreme Pro cards. Just get whatever capacity feels right to you, but bigger is always better. You'll never regret getting a bigger SD card. Now let's talk about the other ports on the camera. If we flip over to the left side of it, you'll see three little rubber covers here. The top one is for a remote trigger and has kind of a novel cover there. You will probably never need to use a remote trigger here for this camera. And the reasons are we used to use remote triggers mostly either to remove shutter shake uh, or to create an interval timer into the camera. This camera, I, I usually will recommend using the delayed two second shutter two-second shutter delay instead of using the remote trigger if you want to eliminate camera shake. The remote trigger works fine. It's just I would rather wait two seconds and have to carry around an extra gadget and hook it up and the gadget has a long cord uh, that can get tangled or it's wireless and it can run out of batteries. Anyway, so you don't necessarily have to get that, but I will show you when you can get. The second port here is for your headphone and microphone jack. As you can see on the icons, the headphones are at top and the microphone is on the bottom. You'll use those if you're recording video and either you want to pipe in better quality sound, you'll probably want to use external microphones, uh, and you want to listen to the sound to make sure you're not catching wind noise or something. I'll recommend a microphone for you to get at the end of this. And at the bottom here, we have a USB port and a mini HDMI port. The USB cable for this uh, camera came in your box. You can use that to connect it directly to a computer either for the purposes of tethering or to um, unload pictures without having to use a memory card reader. So you can hook up the USB cable here, plug it into your computer, and then Lightroom can import those pictures. But what I usually do is just take out the memory card and put it into a memory card reader. That's a lot faster, and I find it much more convenient. Um, most computers nowadays have an SD card reader built in, but you can buy an SD card reader if you don't happen to have one. Look for a USB 3 SD card reader. They can be much faster. For the HDMI, the main reason you'll use that is for video recording or monitoring. So if you're a video guy, you could hook up a field monitor to that mini HDMI port and watch the video or record to an external device. Um, in the menu system, you'll notice an option for choosing whether to um, output the display that you see in the back here with all sorts of camera settings and such or to do a clean HDMI out. Those are clean HDMI out. Those are options for you. But most people will never have to worry about or really either of those ports. Um, so if none of that made sense to you, don't sweat it. You don't necessarily ever need to use an HDMI device for this. Here is a remote trigger that I would recommend if you feel like you must get one. You don't have to get one. But I wanted to point this out because a lot of people go and they buy the Nikon remote trigger, which is way overpriced. This one I think is 15 or 20 bucks. Go to stp.io slash d750 timer. We have them. They are published under a bunch of different brand names because it's just some Chinese company that manufactures it for other companies. But they work just fine. They take a couple of AAA batteries and they will like last you for years of service. They have a nice timer built in in case you didn't want to use the intervalometer built into the camera. Let me talk about the default settings for the camera while we kind of go over the buttons and dials on it. The way your camera probably comes is with this dial on the green auto setting. But if I'm completely unsure of what I'm going to be shooting and I just want to play it safe, I'll go ahead and put it in P mode here, program mode. We'll get to the other modes in just a second. For this dial here, you'll notice a second dial that allows you to change the shutter speed. 
It probably comes with S selected, which is single shot. I'll usually move that over to continuous high, CH. That just allows the camera to continually take pictures like that. Of course, you'll turn the camera on by using the dial under the shutter here. You'll slide it to the right to on, and you can slide it even further if you want to light up the LCD display, the little light bulb there. Just makes it easier to see at night. So remember, everybody, when they go out and do night photography for the first time, you suddenly realize you don't actually know where the buttons and dials are. You can at least see your current settings by sliding that over because your finger can always find the shutter button. I love the, the placement of that button on Nikon cameras, really nice. The other default setting that I like to use is to set this to autofocus. You'll notice there's a dial here on the front that switches between manual focus and autofocus. You'll pretty much always be using autofocus. There are scenarios where you want manual focus. Most lenses will also have an autofocus, manual focus switch on them. So there's actually two switches here. If you want to autofocus, they have to both be in autofocus. If you want to manually focus, only one of them has to be in manual focus. So I, on Nikon cameras, I always prefer to use this switch here to switch between autofocus and manual focus because it's always in the same place. That way I never, I never have to go to the lens and search for the manual focus autofocus switch because my fingers always know where that is. So I'll switch that over to autofocus. One more default setting, I like to make sure that the ISO is set to auto. The ISO controls the relative virtual sensitivity of your camera sensor, and if you have it set to auto, the camera will kind of make that uh, decision for you, which you can change that later, but for now, let's just keep it on auto. I'm going to hold down the ISO button here, and then I'm going to scroll the front dial underneath my shutter finger here. I'm going to scroll that until it says ISO auto, and now ISO auto ISO is enabled, and the camera's making that extra decision for me. And then I'm pretty much ready to take pictures of any scenario without too much going on. Oh, there is one more thing you should check, and that's exposure compensation. We'll cover this in just a bit, but see this plus minus button here? I'll hold that down, and then I can scroll this dial on the back uh, to the left or right to change the value. And you want this to be at zero by default. So just make sure that's at zero. Sometimes that gets changed and people's settings are all messed up and their pictures are messed up. Just wanted to show you where that was. Um, this makes the picture either darker or brighter for your preferences, but zero is usually the best place. Once you have those basic settings in place, you can take a picture. Just hold the camera to your eye and then push the shutter button down halfway. It'll focus, push it down all the way, and it will actually take the picture. Notice it's kind of a two-stage process. Shutter button halfway, focusing, you'll see kind of a red confirmation in the viewfinder, and then all the way down to take the picture. And once you've taken the picture, by default, it will show it on the back of the screen. However, if you want to review it after the picture has gone away, you can push the play button up here in the upper left corner, and it will appear. You can see by default it's showing me the picture, which is our studio along with some information about the picture, like it's taken in RAW, here's the file name, the date and time, I can scroll through different sets of information by pushing up on or down on the directional pad here. So as I push up, you can see it's scrolling through all these different settings. And this last page here actually gives me my metadata. You can see which lens I was using, that it's at 28 millimeters and one third of a second with f4. You have a few options for the information that it will show you. You'll notice as I scrolled through, I didn't see a histogram, and I love to see a histogram. So to change that, I'm going to hit the menu button here in the upper left corner. And then I'm going to go to the very top menu, which is the playback menu. This allows me to change settings for the different sorts of image review. Now, the first thing you'll notice on this playback menu is um, the image review option. Right now it's set to on, and that means that when I take a picture, it will show me that picture, which is a lot of people like to see their pictures. They want to chimp afterwards. Um, however, because it activates the rear display, it's using a lot more batteries. If you want to save batteries and you don't necessarily want to chimp every time, you can always just hit this play button instead and turn the image review off. I also like to not get too distracted by reviewing my current, the pictures I've just taken. I do check them occasionally to make sure I'm not messing up, but I usually prefer to have image review off. Works more like a film camera that way. If you want to change the information that's being displayed during playback, scroll up to playback display options and then scroll to the right. And here you can select or hide the different pages that are displayed when I was pushing, reviewing a picture and pushing up on the directional pad here. 
So what I really like to see is the RGB histogram. And I don't need to see the image only or the highlights or the overview. So when you selected those options, be sure to push OK. Don't just push back or they, it won't remember your settings. So I'll push OK here in the middle of the directional pad. And with that set, if I review pictures, you can see now it's showing me the histogram display split into red, green, and blue, and then all of them combined up here. If you're unsure how to use a histogram, check chapter, chapter four of my book, Stunning Digital Photography, because I explain all of that for you. Live view. It's kind of like when you take a picture with your smartphone, you know how you, you hold your camera out here and you can see everything on the big display. It can actually be really nice. And this camera, of course, supports that too. So as I'm holding the camera out here, I'm going to hit the LV button down here and that will activate live view. So now it's the camera showing me the display on the back of the camera here and I can focus and take pictures just like I do when I'm using the viewfinder. This camera is really nice because it has a tilty display, so I can tilt that up. And now if I'm working low to the ground, I can put it down there and I don't have to get down on the ground. Or if I'm shooting over a crowd, maybe I'm doing photojournalism work, I can hold it over my head like that and get another foot and a half of height out of myself. Um, one big caveat to using live view with this camera and most DSLRs is it will focus much better when you're using the viewfinder like this. Live view focusing, especially in the Nikon cameras, is slower and less reliable. So it's going to be fine for static subjects, but anytime you're shooting sports or wildlife, you're definitely going to want to use the viewfinder here. Let's talk about the diopter. The viewfinder can basically dial in a, a glasses or contact lens prescription. And that's good, but it can also lead to problems. Even if your vision is perfect, Sometimes the diopter here on the side will get hit accidentally, meaning everything in the viewfinder is blurry. So what everybody should do is take your camera and hold it up to your eye and then move that display. Look, look at the numbers on the bottom. Don't look through the viewfinder, but look at the numbers on the bottom in the viewfinder, like your focal length and or your shutter speed and your f-stop and click that up and down until they're as sharp as possible. And remember, if your camera seems like everything, it's nothing is focusing properly, check that diopter because sometimes it's just the viewfinder. The D-pad lock is another thing that tends to confuse people. The, the directional pad here, you use it all the time. And there's a switch that gets hit very easily. It'll often get hit just putting it in your bag or taking it out. And if this slides over to the L, the camera then ignores this directional pad and it seems like your camera is not working properly. Just remember, you have to unlock it and it does get hit accidentally. I've definitely spent like 20 minutes trying to troubleshoot that before I figured out what I was doing. Let's talk about the different camera modes. We've been in program mode because program mode is easy. The camera does all the thinking for you, but that doesn't give you a lot of creative control. Aperture priority gives you control over the camera's aperture. The aperture is the, the iris. It's like the opening or closing of a diaphragm that's inside of the lens. That does two things. It controls the amount of light from the outside environment that will pass through the lens and get to your sensor. So in other words, in low light conditions, you might want to make sure it's wide open so that you're getting as much light as possible. It also controls the amount of what we call depth of field or background blur. If you have a low f-stop number like f2.8, you will have a high background blur. If you have a high f-stop number, you'll have high background sharpness. So low f-stop number, low background sharpness, high f-stop number, high background sharpness. Here's an example. These three pictures were taken with an 85 millimeter f1.8 lens. On the left, you see a picture of Chelsea at f1.8. And as you can see, the background is just completely blurred. In the middle, same conditions, but at f8. And here the background is much more in focus and it provides a lot more context to the image. Now we can kind of see more details about the street that she's in. We can see the cars in the background. And at f22, a high f-stop number, you see we have high background sharpness. You can see at the bottom of the image, the three different examples of what the iris might look like as it's being what we call shut down to smaller f-stop numbers. Photographers will say they'll open up to a low f-stop number or they'll shut down to a high f-stop number. If you want more information about aperture, here's a free video. Go to sdp.io slash 
f-stop. I will teach you everything about aperture. That video is very, very intensive. To put your camera into aperture priority mode, take this mode dial here and switch it over to A. You have to push in this button in the center. So I'll push that in, and while I'm holding it down, I'll twist it, and then I'll let go. That's a lock. It just prevents it from moving around. So now that it's in A, it's in aperture priority. And either looking at the LCD here or the live view screen at the back. Let me get this turned on by hitting the info button. Now I can change the... I can change the... Uh, main dial here in the front underneath my shutter button. I'll twist that and you can see now I'm changing the f-stop number here. So if I go all the way to the left, it'll go to the lowest f-stop number for your lens. I'm using an f4 lens, so the lowest I can go is f4. If I go to the right, I can select anything between the minimum and maximum f-stop number. I can go all the way up to f22 on this particular lens. The minimum and maximum will vary by lens. So at this point, you might not know what different f-stops you want. Um, this video and chapter four of Stunning Digital Photography can help you better choose that. I just wanted to show you where it was on this camera. If you're unsure, just choose the lowest f-stop number. That's almost always the best f-stop number, but it does vary depending on conditions. Now let's talk about shutter priority. The aperture controls the iris. The shutter speed controls how long the shutter stays open. So as you can imagine, if the shutter stays open a long time, it gathers a whole bunch of light. If the shutter open and closes really fast, it will gather less light, but it will freeze action. People think that pictures happen in an instant, but pictures always are taken over a period of some period of time. And if your shutter speed is 1 60th, but something is going 100 miles an hour at fairly close range, it's going to be blurry because the object, the car or whatever, will have moved over the course of 1 60th of a second and your cap camera will capture the object during that movement. So it'll come across as a blur. That can be used to good effect, or it can be a problem depending on what you're trying to do and what the conditions are. For detailed information about which shutter speed you might want to use in different condi conditions, check out this video at sdp.io slash settings. I will show you an example of how shutter speed can be used effectively. Here's three pictures of my daughter from a long time ago. At one eighth of a second on the left there, you see that she's, she's spinning on a merry-go-round and I'm on the opposite end, so I'm moving at the same speed. Therefore, she is sharp in all three of the pictures, but the background appears to be moving. So at one eighth of a second, that motion is conveyed because the background has this panning motion to it. At a faster shutter speed, one thirtieth of a second, the background doesn't move as far, so you see less of that movement. At a fast shutter speed, 1 1 25th of a second, the background is completely frozen. I choose shutter priority anytime I want to control that action. To select it on the D750, again, we'll hold down the mode dial lock here and twist this over to S. And now, let's pull up uh, hit the info button to bring up the back display. Now I can change the shutter speed with the back dial. If you're accustomed to Canon cameras, Canon cameras do everything with the same front dial. Nikon cameras will do the aperture with the front dial and the shutter speed with the back dial. That's convenient because when you get into manual mode and you're controlling both separately, the dials are still in the same places. Now you'll notice that as I'm adjusting the shutter speed, the camera is also changing the f-stop number. It's doing that to maintain the exposure of the image. As I mentioned, a slow shutter speed gathers a lot more light. Therefore, to gather a consistent amount of light and make sure the picture isn't too bright, the camera has to close the aperture down to something smaller. Because we have auto ISO enabled, it will also vary the ISO, which is kind of the sensitivity. So these three factors, plus the amount of light in your environment, will control how bright or dark your image is. One more mode here that we want to talk about is manual mode. To get your camera into manual mode, again, push the mode lock here and twist the mode dial over to M. Now, we can control the shutter speed with the back dial and the aperture with the front dial. And notice neither is changing automatically. I have to change them both. For detailed instructions on how to select different settings for manual mode, I make it easy. Go to sdp.io slash go manual. If you want to get into different types of wildlife photography, I'll provide some uh, useful videos for you here. 
If you get into night photography, visit sdp.io slash NP. I have a good overview. For landscape photography, visit sdp.io slash LS. For wildlife, go to sdp.io slash WL. And of course, I cover all these in stunning digital photography. Let's talk about bulb mode. Bulb mode keeps the shutter open for a long period of time, something longer than 30 seconds. So by default, we're in manual mode now. If I, if I scroll through the different shutter speeds and I keep going left, you'll see I get to one second here. That's one with the quote means one second. I can go all the way up to 30 seconds and then it ends. Because for some reason, Nikon artificially limits us to just taking 30 second exposures. But if you're taking, uh, for example, star trails at night, or if you're in a really dark environment, you might want to shoot for one minute or two minutes or 10 minutes or even an hour. You can do that with bulb mode. To use bulb mode, go one more click to the left and it will say bulb here. When you're in manual mode, keep in mind. And in bulb mode, what will happen is, as you have the shutter held down, it will keep the shutter open for as long as you hold your finger there. And then when you let go, it will close the shutter and finalize the picture. Now, you probably don't want to stand there with your finger on the shutter for 12 minutes or whatever, right? Because you'd shake the camera and you'd get bored. So you could use the remote shutter trigger that I showed you earlier to lock the shutter open and then just come back to it when you're done and close it. Um, I wanted to mention that because if you read my book, Stunning Digital Photography, I will talk about bulb mode and what it's useful for. But this camera has a better technology than bulb mode. It has a timer mode. So we'll go back to this display and going from 30 seconds to bulb mode and then one more click to the left, you'll see time. Time is really useful. With time, instead of holding down the shutter button, you just push it once to open the shutter and another time to close the shutter. So I'll push it once here. You hear that shutter open. The shutter is open now. And if I look through the viewfinder, it's completely black. Because of the way DSLRs work, there's a mirror in there that bounces light up to the viewfinder. And when, of course, it's capturing pictures, that mirror is flipped out of the way so the sensor can get it. So you can't see anything in the viewfinder. The shutter has been open this whole time. When I'm done with my picture, after 10 minutes or however long I want to take the picture, I'll just push the shutter again. And it will close it. It'll flip that mirror back down so I can see through the viewfinder again. And I could review my picture, but it's going to be all white <laughs> because I took, I don't know, a 30 second exposure in fairly bright light. And that's too much. You wouldn't, you would only do an exposure of that length in at night in near uh, dark environments. Let's take a little bit of time and plug my books. I have a series of books that can help you learn photography. They all are available for less than $10 in ebook format or about 20 bucks for the paperback version. Uh, go to Amazon, search for Tony Northup, and you'll see these books, and you can see external kind of unbiased reviews, and you'll see that people like these books. My photography book, which teaches techniques, it's the most popular photography book in the world, Stunning Digital Photography. I promise you will, that will do more to improve your pictures than learning all the buttons and dials on your camera. Because I teach things like lighting, and mood, and storytelling, and time, and posing, and expression and how to control the light, composition, like the actual art of photography. <laughs> These videos just teach you the buttons and dials. That would be like if you ta taught somebody to drive by just saying, here's the steering wheel, there are the pedals, this is how it works. Obviously, you wouldn't be a safe driver, right? There's a little bit of subtlety to driving, like how to do things gracefully, how to interact with other drivers. Those are the things that stunning digital photography teaches you. So that is the best investment you can possibly make is a little bit of education. It's not a boring book. It comes with 14 hours of video. It comes with a subscription to a Facebook group where your peers, other people who are learning, can answer your questions and give you feedback on individual pictures. It has a ton of hands-on practices and quizzes at the end of every chapter to help reinforce your learning. That's why it's the most popular photography book. Do check it out. If you get into post-processing, I have books on Lightroom and Photoshop. Uh, I also have a book on camera gear, which will teach you what all the different terms, like what focus breathing means with lenses and exactly uh, what you should look for when buying a new lens or flash or upgrading your camera body. Check them all out at our store, sdp.io slash store. Or like I said, just go to Amazon and search for Tony Northup plug over. Let's talk about the shutter modes on the camera. I mentioned this earlier, but this dial on the left here, there's a lock here. 
you hold this lock down and then you can just twist this dial to select different shutter modes. S here is single shutter. If I hold the shutter down, it will take one picture. And that's it. If I want to take two pictures, I have to keep pushing it multiple times. Um, I almost always take more than one picture, just because even if you're just taking a snapshot of a friend, what if they blink during that one picture? What if they just have like kind of an awkward expression? If you rattle off a couple of pictures, you can always delete those pictures. This isn't film. It's okay to take 10 pictures and only share one of them. CL, continuous low, takes pictures at this pace. If you want to take them a little faster, like for sports and wildlife, go to CH. See, much faster. I pretty much just use CH all the time. That's why that's my recommended default setting. Even with a portrait, I'll rattle off three or four frames and then just go through and pick the sharpest one or the one with the best expression, etc. So continuous high, very, very useful. There are a couple of other shutter modes here. Q is for quiet, but that's like quiet single. So I'll push it once and it'll take one picture. You can see it's not silent, but it's quieter. So if you're shooting a wedding, and you don't want your shutter to be like banging like a timpani in the in the chapel or like a light jazz concert those are times when you might want to use quiet mode it's also useful if you're up close and personal with wildlife qc is quiet continuous and you can see it's not quite as fast as continuous high it's also a, it's just a bit quieter it's honestly it's still kind of loud it doesn't have a silent shutter like some cameras do nowadays, but Q and QC is better than nothing. A couple other modes on this mode dial you should know about. This is the timer. The timer will delay a bit. After you push the shutter, you can see that blinking light there. So by default, it's gonna blink for 10 seconds, and then when it's done, it's finally going to take the picture. There we go. 10 seconds is for those times when you have the camera on a tripod and you wanna take a picture and then run around and put your arm behind your family. That's kind of slow because you'd have to be running back and forth between your, your camera and your family. So I don't often use that. I'll show you how to use the interval timer in a bit to do a better job of that. I will, however, use the delayed shutter when I want to, when I have the camera on a tripod and I want to get steadier pictures because when you push this button here, your shutter button, it will actually shake the camera a little bit and that will make your pictures noticeably less sharp, especially for things like macro photography. So what I'll do is I'll set that continuous shutter to a shorter period of time. I'll show you how to do that. Hit the menu button here, go to the pencil icon, and then go to C, timers slash AE lock. Then scroll to the right, and C3 is self timer. So I'll select that, and then you can see self timer delay is set to 10 seconds. So what we can do instead is set that to two seconds. And now when I take a picture, it lights up, and then two seconds later it takes the picture. And two seconds is generally enough to eliminate any shutter shake. Now, I mentioned earlier, if you wanted to do the 10 seconds and you want to run around behind, put your arm behind your family, what you'll do is you go to that same setting, timers AE lock, go to C3, we'll set this over to 10 seconds, and then for number of shots, instead of one, we're gonna set this to a higher number, like nine. And then the interval between the shots, you could do five seconds, but for a selfie, I usually like to have a two or three second separation between the pictures. So now it'll take, it'll wait 10 seconds, it'll take nine shots, and then it will take a shot every two seconds. So if I push that shutter, you can see it's blinking. Now you're running around behind your family. You got your arm around them. People can see the blinking light. They know that they should get ready to smile. It goes solid, smile. And now every two seconds, it's gonna take a picture. And people will kind of get to know this meter of it happening every two seconds. So they'll be able to kind of prep their face. And I guarantee you the first shot won't be the best one, but maybe the fifth or the sixth shot will be the best one. And if nothing else, if you get really desperate, uh, you can always combine different faces from different photos from those nine different shots and make an absolutely perfect group photo. For more tips about group photos, check out chapter six of my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Now let's talk about the different focusing modes. By default, it's in a mode called AFA, which automatically decides whether your subject is still or moving. However, the camera's pretty good about picking it, and that's okay. I almost always prefer to pick the mode myself because, you know, I like to control things, and if a subject is still, I'll just tell the camera that it's still. 
For detailed information about how to use different focusing modes and what, what situations you'll use them, visit sdp.io slash focus. But for now, I'll just show you how to change it on this camera. So you can look at the LCD screen on top here. It's a little easier on camera to see the back display. So I'll hit info to bring that up. But now there's a button on the front here. You see this on the AFM switch here? This is a button. So I'm going to hold that button down. While I'm holding it down, I'll move this back dial. And you can see I'm switching between AFA, AFS, and AFC. AFS is for single focus, which means it will lock onto a subject and then stop focusing. It just assumes that subject is perfectly still. AFC is for continuous focus. It will track a moving subject, assuming that there's some movement in there. So what is still and what is actually moving? If you're taking a portrait, you're moving because you're probably holding the camera handheld. You're moving a little bit, not a lot, but you're moving a little bit. That little bit of difference, especially with shallow depth of field, can mean the difference between a picture being in focus and out of focus. So even for portraits, but especially for things like sports and wildlife, I will use AFC. In fact, I pretty much always leave the camera in AFC mode on the D750 because it has an excellent focusing system. If I were using, say, a D610, which has a lower end focusing system, I would be regularly switching between AFS and AFC. But on this camera, AFC pretty much works well for all situations. Besides choosing the focusing mode, you can choose the focusing area. By default, the camera might be focusing on all different focusing points. So to change the focusing area, we're going to hit the same button and hold it down, the focusing button here. I'm going to hold that down. Instead of moving the back button, I'm going to move the, the front dial here. And as I change that, you can see a little display here that switches between the different modes. So by default, you'll probably see this. And this mode will use any focusing point. Basically, the camera will use all the focusing points and focus on something. But it's not necessarily what you want to focus on. For example, it might focus on somebody's nose or forehead instead of right on their eye where you want to focus it. Or it might focus on some tree branches instead of the bird. For that reason, I don't really ever like to use that mode. Instead, what I like to use is a single focusing point. So that's the option for single focusing point. Here you just see the little brackets. This is nine focusing points in the middle, 21 focusing points, 51 focusing points, and 3D focusing is almost always the right choice for fast-moving sports like soccer or basketball. But for every other situation, I'll choose the single focusing point and then manually select my focusing point. So as you're looking through the viewfinder with a single focusing point selected, you can change the focusing point by moving the directional pad, and it will be highlighted in the viewfinder. If I turn on live view here, you can see the same thing will work here. It just takes a little bit longer. I have to kind of hold it to move it around. In live view, you can focus pretty much anywhere in the frame. When you're using the viewfinder, you're limited to a set number of focusing points that you can see. But as a reminder, the viewfinder focusing works much better. It operates much, much faster. To review, I use AFC for everything except fast moving sports where 3D tracking actually works really well. A word about 3D tracking. I'll turn this on and hit that focusing button on the front and then move it over to 3D tracking. 3D tracking will let you start with a single autofocus point. But then once you have that shutter button held down or held down halfway, it will lock on whatever is underneath that single focusing point and track it as it moves through the frame. So if you're tracking a soccer player and they move from the, the right side of the frame to the left side of the frame, it will, you'll see that point move. It'll switch points and continue to track that subject. It's also great for flying birds, which tend to move around in the frame because it's hard to keep your camera completely steady. That's why it's so good for sports. So lock that single focusing point on your subject and then allow the camera to track it throughout the frame for sports and flying birds. Now let's talk about ISO. And yes, it's ISO, not ISO. If you want to know everything about ISO, <laughs> here's a free video, sdp.io slash ISO, where I explain all of that. I've already kind of mentioned this, but if you want to change the ISO, hold down the ISO button here, and then use the back dial to change to a manual ISO setting to manually change your ISO value, or move the front dial here to turn auto ISO on or off. We also have the option to limit auto ISO on how high it can go. So some people 
don't want it to go over ISO 6400 for any reason because they know that a high ISO, while being great for shooting in low light conditions, adds a lot of noise. Low ISOs always have cleaner images, but you can't just always use the base ISO of ISO 100 because uh, it might require you to have a shutter speed that's too long and you'd end up with motion blur. You can limit that upper ISO. I'll show you how to do it. I'll hit the menu button here. I'll go to the camera icon, and then I'll scroll down to towards the bottom, all the way down to ISO sensitivity settings. And then I'll scroll to the right here. And now you can see it's showing my current ISO, which I can change using the ISO shortcut here. And then I'll scroll down to maximum sensitivity. So here you can see I can set that even higher, or I could set it to something lower. Now, while I definitely prefer the cleanliness of low ISOs, I know that in low light conditions like a bar or a club, I have no choice but to use a high ISO. And so for that reason, I will let the camera go all the way up to high two. That's one of the settings that I change for my own personal preferences. If you're shooting some sort of action, sports or wildlife, or even an event like a wedding reception, you might want to set the minimum shutter speed to the lowest shutter speed that you will go and not get motion blur. So if you're shooting an event, that might be 1 60th of a second. If you're shooting something like basketball, you might want to make sure that it stays at 1 500th of a second. So set that minimum shutter speed to whatever you're comfortable with, and then the auto ISO will be that much more useful. Because if you don't set a minimum shutter speed, then the camera might be choosing a higher shutter speed than necessary, and if it chooses a fast shutter speed, it has to choose a faster ISO as well. To recap, high ISO introduces more noise into your pictures, so you always want to use the lowest ISO you can. All of those settings, unless you're in full manual mode with manual ISO, changing those settings will not change the overall brightness of your image. The way you'll change the brightness of your image is by using exposure compensation. Exposure compensation tells the camera that you want the image to be darker or brighter than what it would do by default. So let's go back and I'll just put this into aperture priority mode. And I'll take a picture of the screen here. Turn that on. Oh, got to get that out of timer mode. And as we review that, we can look at the histogram and I can see that this part of the histogram is not touching the right side, but it really should be. And that tells me that the image isn't quite bright enough. If you don't know how to use a histogram, check chapter four of studying digital photography. The way to fix that is by using exposure compensation. So see this plus minus button here? That's the international symbol for exposure compensation. So I'm gonna hold that down and then I'm gonna use the back dial here to increase the exposure compensation. So you can see either in the LCD up here, you'll see that change. Or if you look through the viewfinder, you'll also see it change. And we can see it in live view down here. You can see it saying, now I'm at plus one. Or if I go to the left, I can go down to minus one. It's kind of hard to read, but it says minus one. So let's go up to plus one and take another picture. And if I compare this most recent picture to the one before it, look how the histogram changed. The original picture with the default settings was a little dark. It didn't use that right quarter of the histogram, which is the most important part of the histogram. If I scroll to the right, you can see the histogram move to the right and the image here is brighter. That's what exposure compensation does. If you say, hey camera, the picture you took with auto exposure, not bright enough or too bright, exposure compensation allows you to fix it. It's where your human intelligence comes in. You don't have to go to full manual mode to make those sorts of corrections. Instead, most of the time you should use auto exposure and when necessary, dial auto exposure up or down. You will use auto exposure in conditions where the foreground lighting and the background lighting are drastically different. So if you have a friend who has an overcast sky behind them and you're taking a picture of your friend, I bet that friend's face is going to be too dark because the camera is going to see that bright overcast sky and try to expose that to be what they call middle gray. So because there's that bright sky, your friend's going to end up dark or even a full silhouette. In those situations, you would use exposure compensation and add one stop or two stops of light to better balance the exposure. Same thing will happen if you're taking pictures on snow. For detailed information about how to use and when to use exposure compensation, watch this video, sdp.io slash ec, 
or check chapter three in my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Let's talk about shooting either RAW or JPEG. These are two different file formats. By default, your camera will come configured to take a JPEG picture. JPEG is the most common file format. Every, almost every picture you see on the web is a JPEG. JPEG is just heavily compressed and it's ready to share. But when your camera compresses that JPEG picture, it throws away a lot of really useful information, like lots of detail in shadows and highlights. And that's kind of a shame. I mean, JPEG pictures can be fine and they can look great, but if you shoot raw, it will capture that additional information and you can use that to better edit your photos and even to recover from pictures that are underexposed or overexposed. And especially on this camera, you can recover those pictures and never even know that you blew it. So shooting raw is like this extra layer of safety that allows you to fix problems after the fact. It's kind of a miracle and kind of a revelation. And if you want to understand the differences in great detail, visit this link, sdp.io slash raw v JPEG. For now, I'm just gonna show you how to switch from JPEG to raw. So I'll hit the menu button here. I'm gonna select the camera icon and then up near the top, you'll see the image quality item. If I scroll to the right, by default, it will probably be on JPEG fine or JPEG normal. You'll select NEF raw in parentheses. Now, once you do this, it's going to be capturing files with a .NEF extension instead of a .JPEG extension. And you can't share .NEF files on the web. You have to share JPEG files, which means you need software to convert those files from NEF to JPEG. And just about every photographer in the world uses some type of software to do that. Most of us use software called Adobe Lightroom. So check out Adobe Lightroom, use that to process, manage, edit, and share your pictures. Um, I'll give you a link to it in just a little bit. It's a pain that you have to use the software, but it's pretty much what we all do. If you're not sure about using RAW files, what you can do is you can use RAW files and JPEG files, have the camera write one of each. So you can select RAW plus JPEG. I'll select that there. And now it's gonna write those two pictures side by side. Therefore, if for some reason you don't get into raw editing, you'll have the raw in case you get into it in the future, but you also have the JPEG to work natively with. Let's talk about the different metering modes. And if, if you're a casual user, you can just skip this section. More serious users want to understand metering modes because, well, there's kind of some history to it. Like back in the film era, we took a picture and then we had no idea what it looked like until you actually developed your film and examined it with a loop or something. You wouldn't know if you under or overexposed it. Therefore, precise metering became really important. Metering is the camera's method for examining the light in the scene and determining how bright or how dark the scene should be, what the camera settings should be. So in the film era, we came up with all these different modes like image, uh, like center weighted averaging and spot metering that would allow skilled photographers to really nail the exposure without ever being able to view the results in real time. But in the digital era, we really don't need that. First, the cameras have more intelligent default metering because the complex multiprocessor in there, microprocessor in there can better evaluate the scene and is more likely able to nail the exposure without your intervention. Um, but also, you can take a picture and then review it. And if it's under or overexposed, you adjust the exposure compensation and shoot again. So that's what I recommend almost all of you do, is leave the metering at the default and then use exposure compensation as necessary. But if you know you wanna use spot metering or something else, here's how you do it. I'll hit the info button just to show you that. Let's turn that off. There's a button dedicated to metering here. It just looks like five little blocks. So you'll hold that button down. And now I can scroll the back dial to choose between the different metering modes. And this is the default. It looks like the button, the five little blocks. If I scroll it here, that is precise spot metering. It will meter a little spot from wherever you're focused, wherever your focusing point is, and base the entire exposure off of that. This without the asterisk is just a little bit bigger of an area. And then center weighted uses a bigger uh, part of the image from the center, and then scrolling it again, we get back to the default. Again, I would just leave it at that. Um, for detailed information about the metering modes, go back to my exposure compensation video, sdp.io slash ec, or check chapter four in stunning digital photography.
Now let's talk about the flash. This camera has a flash on it. You can push the little flash button here and it will pop up. When you take a picture, the flash will fire when it's up and it might make ugly results. Flash, uh, I, I never use on camera flash. It, it's just like always bad, but some people will use it and that's okay. I will show you how to use it. Once you have it up, remember this flash button here? You can hold that down to adjust how bright or dark the flash is. So now that I'm holding it down, I'll move this front dial here to change the flash exposure compensation. So you see it says here flash compensation plus one. That means it would be twice as bright. Each stop is a doubling or halving of the light. If I scroll to the right, it'll go up to plus one, or I can scroll to the left to minus one, or minus two, or all the way down to minus three. So when I do have to use the onboard flash, I will usually by default go down to minus 1.3 stops of flash exposure compensation. That tells the camera to just put out a little less than half the light that it normally would, which means people won't be quite as washed out. It'll just rely more on the ambient light. So that's something to consider. It's something you really, it takes some skill because you have to look at the individual scenario, the lighting in your current environment to determine what the best situation is. The other option you can change by holding this button down, the flash button down, if you move the back dial, you can switch between regular flash, which you see here, nothing in there, red eye reduction flash, which just gives a little pre-flash to let people's eyes dilate, their pupils, slow, which fires the, slow fires the flash at the end of the exposure rather than at the beginning. The only reason you'd use the slow flash is if you're doing night photography and say there's a car moving through the scene. Um, if you flash at the beginning, it would look weird because the car's headlights, you'd see the car on the right side of the frame and then the car's headlights would extend in front of the car because the headlights would continue to make a trail even after the flash had fired. I described this in chapter three of stunning digital photography. This makes no sense. Anyway, that's the only reason you'd ever use slow, but for the most part, you'll just leave it at the default or with the red eye reduction on. Let's talk about the white balance. You, this is another thing you probably never have to change, but I will show you how to change it. By default, uh, your camera will automatically adjust to varying different types of light. So for example, you might've experienced that regular incandescent lights have like a little bit of a yellow tint to them and LED lights have a little bit of a blue tint to them. Our sun is somewhere in between. It's what we just call sunlight balance because it's all based on the sun. And flashes are sunlight balance and most professional lights like these are sunlight balanced. Fluorescent lights have a different color. Street lights can have a different color still. So you have all these different colors of light, but you still want white things to look white even if they're under a little bit of a yellow light, right? So the camera will detect the color of the light in the room and then adjust to that. So your white, if you're taking a picture of a white book, it'll still look white by default. I like to use auto white balance, especially because I shoot raw. If the camera guesses the white balance incorrectly, I can always change it later on my computer. So I just prefer to do that rather than fussing with it at the time I'm taking the picture. I'd rather think about the artistry of the picture, like the composition and the storytelling and not have to worry about the white balance. If you do want to manually set the white balance, here's how you do it. I'll pull in the info here and then you'll see a button here that says WB. I'm just gonna hold that button down. And now I can scroll this back dial here to switch between the different white balance modes. So you can see auto here is what you'll pretty much always wanna leave on. But you can choose between incandescent bulbs, fluorescent bulbs, the sun, uh, flash, a cloudy day in the shade, which is a little bit cooler, or you can manually dial in a specific Kelvin by selecting K and then moving that front dial. That's if somehow you've measured the light temperature in Kelvin. You can also preset a white balance, but again, for the most part, auto white balance and shooting raw will allow you to fix it in post without having to worry about it. Let's talk about recording video with this camera. Video always uses live view. You cannot use the viewfinder while you're rec recording video. The switch down here with the live view button. I'm gonna switch that to the video camera and then I'm gonna hit the LV button. And that'll flip the mirror out of the way so my viewfinder is no longer working, but I can see what's going on back here. Now I can focus like normal and I can start recording by pushing the record button here. So I'll push that and you can see it's now recording. It shows record here. You can see meters from the microphone so it can, it's picking my voice up. 
And you can see it's recording for a 10 minute period of time here. You can even see which card it's recording to. This is counting down the amount of time that is left remaining in it. And you can see the camera settings are displayed down here. I can change the aperture while I'm recording to add more depth of field. You can refocus while recording, but I don't recommend it because the autofocusing on this camera during video is really ugly. Like it will focus, but it will just look ugly and jerky. So either I would very carefully manually focus or I would just try to focus and leave it and not change it during the course of recording. There are a couple of video settings I want to point out. So I'll hit the menu button here and then I'll scroll over to the video camera. The most important one is going to be the frame size slash frame rate. So I'll select that. And here you can select between different HD video modes. And I think by default it comes in at 1920 by 1080 at 30 frames a second. I love 60p. So most of the time, if you're watching TV in America, you'll see it at 30 frames a second. If you're watching TV in Europe, it'll be at like 25 frames a second approximately. Um, 60 frames a second just means you have twice as many little still pictures every second and it means everything is kind of more smooth and every pc gamer kind of knows the benefits of that this video that you're watching on youtube is recorded on 30 frames a second that is the most common format but if you do use 60 frames a second everything is a little bit more smooth and if you do post post edit your if you edit your video in post it means you could slow it down to two times slow motion while still maintaining super smooth movement. So that's really nice for something like sports. You could have a little slow motion segment and cut that in. They use that in TV a lot. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that tip out there for switching it over to 60 frames a second. Otherwise, one thing you might wanna change is the microphone sensitivity. By default, it'll probably be set to auto sensitivity, which is okay only for the most casual recordings. Most of the time, you want to switch it to manual sensitivity and then adjust it up or down based on the level. So you don't ever want the levels to be peaking. Like if I push this way up. Okay, so now I'm getting into the red and my voice is peaking, which means parts of the sound are gonna be clipping. I'll just lower that down until the loudest I'm speaking is going to be a little bit in the yellow and that'll give me the best audio quality in post. You also wanna use manual sensitivity if you hook up an external microphone. Just be sure to actually go in there and check the levels every time that you record because you know, a different placement of a mic or different settings on the microphone can drastically change the input that's going into the camera here. And that, that's pretty much all you need to know about, um, well, it's the fundamentals that you need to know about using video on this camera. Let's talk about the interval timer. The interval timer, you can also use it for selfies like I showed you to use for, with the delayed shutter. But the interval timer is also great for making time lapses. So you can set the camera up to take a picture every minute over the course of 24 hours and show a whole time lapse of the sun rising and setting. Here's how you do the interval timer. I'll hit the menu button under the camera icon here. I'll scroll down a bunch until I get to interval timer shooting and then I'll scroll to the right. Now you can see I can go to start options to control when to start or just to start now. And then I can go down to interval and scroll to the right and select how frequently I wanna take a picture. So now it's set up to take a picture every three seconds. Maybe you wanna do it every one second. So let's select one second and then the number of shots. Right now it's set to take uh, one interval of one shot. So if we wanted to take a bunch of shots, um, we could just set that to 9,000 and then it would kind of go indefinitely. Now the difference here is this is how many different intervals and this is how many shots to take per interval. So if you had it taking pictures every one second and you did it like that, like three shots per interval, it would wait one second and then fire off three different shots, which probably isn't what you want. You almost, almost always want that last number set to just one. And then this can be set to something high so that it will shoot basically indefinitely. And if you set it to 9,000, um, and you don't want to wait for 9,000 pictures, like you get bored of waiting, you can just turn the camera off and that will inter inter interrupt the interval. If you are making a time lapse, think about the number of pictures that you need. Usually if you're making a video out of it and the video is gonna be at 30 frames a second, of course you need 30 pictures for every second. 
If you're making a little video clip and you want it to last, say, six seconds on the screen, that means you need 180 pictures. So make sure that you time it out correctly. If you're shooting once every second at 60 seconds per minute, that means you need to wait three minutes of picture taking to get a six second video. But you might also need to trim the beginning and ends of that video, or you might want to cross fade that video with some other clip that you have in video. So it always, it's always better to have more pictures than fewer pictures. So if I wanted to make a six second clip, I'd probably make sure that I had at least enough uh, time lapse pictures for a 10 second clip because you never know, <laughs> right? It's always better to have too many. Let's talk about mirror lockup. I mentioned earlier that the, there's a mirror in here, and I'll, I'll take this lens off now. To take the lens off, you'll hold the button on the, the left side here in, and then twist the lens to the right, and it will come off. Now, as we look in here, you'll see a mirror that's angled up towards the viewfinder, and then there's a prism in here that bounces back, back to my eye. When I go to take a picture, you'll see that whole mirror move out of the way. This shakes the camera just a little bit. Not enough to ruin your pictures or make them blurry, but it shakes it a little bit, especially with things like macro photography. If you're on a tripod, you might notice that little bit of camera shake. You can use mirror lockup to eliminate that camera shake. And actually the easiest way to do that is just to use live view. So I'd put it back in still mode and then just hit LV. This always flips the mirror up. You can see if I take the lens back off, Oh, it's not letting me go into live view. Oh, there we go. You can see live view just flips the mirror up so that you just see the sensor there. And that's actually a much easier way to use mirror lockup than to go through and manually turn it on. I just wanted to mention that because when you get into macro and night photography, I'll mention mirror lockup and SDP. Just turn live view on. Let's talk about how to format your memory cards. Earlier I showed you how to insert your memory cards. At some point, you will probably fill those up. At that point, you should unload them onto your computer, back up those pictures somewhere else in case there's a fire, and then format your memory card so you can reuse it. It's like, it's like film that can be reused. To format your memory card, hit the menu button, go down to the wrench icon, and then the very first option here is format memory card. So scroll to the right, pick either slot one or slot two, scroll to the right again, scroll up to yes, and then don't scroll to the right, but click the OK there in the middle of the directional pad and that will format your memory card. If you accidentally format your memory card, there's a free tool that can recover them from the memory card for you. So visit stp.io slash photo rec for that free tool. If you search for image recovery, you'll find a bunch of tools trying to charge you 50 bucks or 100 bucks. This is free. They pretty much all use the same tool underneath. So there, I just saved you some money, right? That tool is also useful if you accidentally, if, if a hard drive gets screwed up or something, it can often rec recover important files. So keep that in mind. Sometimes the camera will come with the beep enabled so that when you take a picture or focus, it'll beep beep. That's infuriating. <laughs> to everybody around you, at least. I can't tell you as a wedding photographer how many weddings I've been to where people are taking pictures from the stands. And so the whole chapel is just filled with beep 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 please turn that beeping off. You'll still have visual confirmation of seeing focus. Everything will light up red. To turn the beep off, I'll hit the menu button here. I'll go over to the pencil icon. I'll go down to D, shooting display. I'll scroll to the right. And the first item here is beep. You want to set the volume to off. And thank you for turning off that beep. Now I'll talk about back button focus. By default, when you push this shutter button halfway, the camera will focus. And then when you push it all the way, it will take a picture. That's okay. That's the way every camera pretty much ever has worked by default. But it has a major drawback because there are times when you don't want the camera to autofocus. For example, if you get into night photography, you might, and focusing can be very difficult. So you might finally get properly fo focused on the stars or some other subject and you'll take a picture. But then you want to take another picture of it for safety. And when you go to push the shutter button, the camera will refocus and misfocus and haunt. So you have to start this whole process over again. You could overcome that by switching the camera to manual focus, but then you'd have to manually focus it. Back button focus decouples focusing from the shutter button. Instead of focusing with the shutter button, you'll focus by pushing this button here. And so basically your thumb and forefinger will work together giving you complete control over whether the camera focuses or not. 
It also allows you to use Focus and Recompose, a technique I discuss in Chapter 4 of Stunning Digital Photography. You can use Focus and Recompose with AFC mode. And if you don't know what that means now, at some point, that'll seem like a really, really useful thing. So here's how you enable Back Button Focus. I'm going to hit the menu icon, and then on the pencil icon here, I'll scroll down to F controls. So I'll scroll to the right, and then I'll scroll down to assign AFL button. And I'll scroll to the right, and you can see by default it's set to press AE, AE, AF lock. I'm going to scroll down to AF on and select that by scrolling to the right. Now, when I have press the shutter, it's not focusing. I can still take pictures, but they might be out of focus. When I want to focus, I'm going to hit this button. Let's turn live view on so you can see it. I'll hit that button, it'll focus. I'll hit that button, it'll focus. But you can see as I'm pushing the shutter, it's not focusing. If I still haven't sold you on back button focus, watch this video, sdp.io slash ybb. I promise, everybody who spends a week with back button focus loves it. Well, almost everybody. While I'm at that menu, I'll show you how you can customize some other buttons. At some point in your photography career, you're going to realize that you use some, access some settings so frequently that you wish one of these buttons were linked to, to it. There's also some buttons up here in the front, like this FN button and the PV button here, where they, they do things by default, but they might not be that useful to you. To customize those, hit the menu button, pencil, F controls, scroll to the right, and then you'll see a bunch of options for this, like customize command dials, assign FN button, which is that button on the front there, assign preview button, which is this button here. So if I select assign preview button, you can see the camera is showing me which button I'm, it is I'm selecting, and then I can assign it to a, a task that I want to do. Um, for example, you could open up My Menu, which is a customizable menu display that I'll talk about in just a little bit, or you could change it to play back the most recently used picture, whatever. So set that up however you find useful. Now let's talk about Wi-Fi. This camera can use Wi-Fi to transfer pictures from the memory cards directly to your phone, and that's really useful if you're on vacation and you want to quickly share some pictures on Facebook, but you don't have a computer. Oftentimes, maybe we go back to the tour bus and we have a half hour drive. I'll pull out my phone and I'll use Wi-Fi to get a picture over to my phone and then I'll post it on Twitter or Instagram or something. To use Wi-Fi, you'll hit the menu button here. And then you'll go down to the wrench icon, inexplicably. I don't know why there's not a separate menu for Wi-Fi, but all the way at the bottom down here, near the bottom, you'll see Wi-Fi. So you'll scroll to the right. Now it says network connection off. I'll scroll to the right again and hit enable. So now the network is turned on and this camera is now acting as a Wi-Fi access point. So now you can pull out your smartphone, either Android or iPhone devices, things like iPads, they can all work. You'll go into your app store and you'll look for the app called uh, the Nikon Wireless Mobility Utility App. It has the icon that looks like that. Not Nikon SnapBridge. Nikon SnapBridge is for newer cameras. This one, wireless mobility, uh, utility app, catchy name, right? <laughs> WMU. Woo They're a little behind the times with the Wi-Fi, but so before I fire that up even, I'm going to open up my Wi-Fi settings. Go to settings, Wi-Fi, and I'm going to connect to this camera's network. So Nikon. And it will connect. Great. And now I can open up the wireless, mobi wireless mobile utility app and hit view photos and then pictures on D750. And now it's going to show me the pictures that I have on the memory card, little thumbnails of them. You can see the beautiful pictures that I've been taking <laughs> during the course of making this video. So to select those to send them to my camera, I'm going to hit select in the lower right corner. And then I can select a couple of different pictures here. You can send RAW files or JPEG files, but the JPEG files will transfer a little bit faster. Now I'll hit the download link at the bottom here. Download. Yes. And you can see it's now starting the transfer. Usually this happens pretty quickly. Um, it's a little slower on higher megapixel cameras like the D810, but the D750 is pretty easy. And almost there with these three pictures. 
download complete, okay. Now I can go back to view photos here, and if I wanna look at those pictures, I can do latest download, and so now I can see them. They're actually local here on my camera. From here, I could hit the share icon right here and put it on Twitter, Facebook, or another app. I don't like the way that kind of works. I actually find it much easier to just open up the app I wanna to use to share, like Instagram, and then say, just post a new picture. And you can see the pictures that I just transferred are, are right here in my phone's library. So from here, it's already an Instagram and I can just continue on. Not too bad. You can also use the WMU app to take pictures. So let's cancel that and go back. Back, okay, take photos. Let's set this level. Let's see if we can see. Uh, oh, there's my cameraman, Justin. <laughs> okay, so I'll zoom in and here we actually, I think we have a touch screen. Focus, try and focus. Okay, so you can see I can even touch to focus and it will focus. It's a little laggy, it's a little slow, but it does work. You can see the settings down here. I can hit that to change a couple of things like download after shooting or to set a self timer. If you wanna change the camera settings, you'll do it from the camera itself. When you're ready, you hit the shutter button and it will take the picture. And by default, it's automatically transferring it here. I find, I don't find the remote control to be that useful, but I can think of a few scenarios where you might want it. I mostly just use it to send pictures from my camera to my phone over the course of a vacation or something. Um, one thing to note, while your camera, while your phone is connected to your camera's Wi-Fi network, it won't see the internet generally. So you won't be able to actually post anything until you go in and disconnect from the Nikon network. Because the camera, the phone is connected to the camera, it's gonna always be telling the camera like, hey, send this to Instagram, and the camera doesn't know how to get to the internet. It's just kind of a weird quirk about the way it works. When you're done with Wi-Fi, I suggest you go in and turn it back off because having Wi-Fi on can use some extra batteries. One last thing, let's talk about how to configure my menu. Digging through those menus can be tough. And you'll find that you use some menu settings pretty regularly, like formatting your memory card, and you hate digging through everything to find them. You can just make a customized menu that has all your favorite stuff. That's called My Menu. So if I scroll down all the way to the bottom, this icon here is called My Menu. I can now go to the top and select Add Items. And you can see it gives me a list of the different menu items here. So if I wanna add format memory card, I know it's under the setup menu, I'll select that, and then scroll to the right to select format memory card. All right, never mind. You can't put format memory card <laughs> on my menu, but you could put other things. So let's go to the photo shooting menu, and let's say we regularly switch between JPEG and RAW. We'll just select that and then back up a little bit. And now when we're on my menu, you can see image quality is right at the top. So I can jump right there to change the image quality. So hopefully you can see how that's useful. I tend to add a bunch of things to my menu because I can never remember which menu all those different settings are. Let's go over some accessories for your camera. These are things that we've uh, ascertained to be the very best from years and years of testing camera gear from different manufacturers. Our favorite software for processing images is a combination of Adobe Lightroom for organizing your collection and doing light quick editing and Photoshop for doing deeper editing. They're available together as a monthly subscription and that's kind of the best way to get it. I know I hate monthly subscriptions too, but Adobe has kind of forced our hand here. Unfortunately, in the US, it's either 10 bucks a month or $100 per year. Go to sdp.io slash Adobe Deal to get both those apps together. And of course, we have books on both Lightroom and Photoshop. For lenses, your camera might have come with the Nikon 24 to 120 lens. That's a good lens. But there's a third party lens that I recommend um, that is almost the same, but it's quite a bit sharper and a little bit faster. That means it lets in a little more light, which means it works a little bit better in low light conditions. That's the lens that I have attached here. That's the Sigma 24 to 105 f4 lens for the Nikon mount. It's built really nice. I find it built better than the Nikon lens, and it only goes to 105 rather than 120. But 
if you shoot at 105 and then crop it down, it still ends up being a little sharper than that Nikon lens is even at 120. Now, when we've tested it, we, that, that, that's the experience that we had. We like the Sigma lens better. An objective third party, DxO Mark, also measured the sharpness of the two lenses. And you can see on the left there, yellow and orange kind of show unsharpness in the lens, whereas green shows sharpness. And on the left, you see the Nikon 24 to 120. And on the right, you see the Sigma uh, 24 to 105. Those are both at around 80 or 85 millimeters. So because this is all green, it just, it's indicating that it's sharper. Sharpness isn't a big deal, <laughs> but we have found that the Sigma is a little bit sharper and almost as versatile. So we do push a lot of people to get that as an upgrade over their kit lens. An even bigger upgrade is to go to one of Nikon's two 24 to 70 lenses. They have two different models. The 24 to 70 G does not have image stabilization. The 24 to 70 E is newer and does have image stabilization. The image stabilized lens is substantially more expensive, but it's also a hair less sharp. That seems counterintuitive, but overall, this is still the best 24 to 70 lens in the Nikon lineup because that image stabilization will help you more than the little bit of optical sharpness that you get out of the standard 24 to 70 because there are just so many conditions where if you're working without image stabilization in this focal length you're going to get shaky pictures so maybe if you're always working on a tripod get the 24 to 70 g but if you're often shooting handheld i highly recommend the 24 to 70 e i will say tamron also has a 24 to 70 f2a lens which is good it's very sharp the only downsides to it are that it's built extremely uh, weakly. It's kind of poor construction. And also it has severe focus breathing. If you search our YouTube channel, you'll see a comparison review between that Tamron and the Nikon 24 to 70 G. If you're shooting ultra wide, which isn't necessarily required for landscapes, but can be really useful. It's also really useful for things like creating special effects, kind of eye catching pictures or shooting in like tight European streets. I recommend the Nikon 14 to 24 F2.8 lens. We have it here. Because you look at that big dome, the big optic on the front. It's just crazy. The, the hood is this thing that like attaches over the front. It's built like a tank. It's a really nice lens. Um, and it will take super wide angles. sdp.io slash n14. These links will take you to buy them and we get a few pennies out of every dollar. It helps to support us. For portraits, there are a lot of different portrait lenses in the Nikon lineup. I recommend most people start with the 70 to 200 f2.8 zoom. The primes are great. The 105 f1.4, fantastic. But the zooms, are, everybody should have a zoom just because they're more versatile. So there are a couple of different lenses you might choose from. The one we're shooting with now for our portrait work is the, the 70-200 f2.8e from Nikon. It's pretty much brand new as I record this. And it's, it's, we found it substantially better than the older generation of 70-200 uh, lens. So pick it up at that... Um, the link down here. This lens, however, is very expensive. And if you want a less expensive alternative, I would point you to the Tamron 7200 f2.8, which is not as well built and has some severe focus breathing, but is still a very sharp lens and just almost just, just about as good for things like sports and other long range work. Just not quite as good for portraiture. You can use that link down there. They only cost about a grand compared to well over $2,000 for the Nikon version. So it's a good value. If you're shooting sports and you want a little more reach out of the 70 to 200s, I would start with the Nikon 1.4 times teleconverter there. You could pick it up at sdp.io slash n14x. Or if you need even more reach out to 400 millimeters, pair your 70 to 200 with a Nikon 2x teleconverter, sdp.io slash n2x. We have a whole video on teleconverters, so check that out. For wildlife, I really like the Nikon 200 to 500 millimeter zoom lens. It's just, it's a, it's a great lens. It's fairly lightweight for how big it is. And it's a fantastic price. You can use the link here. If you want an upgrade from that, I would recommend getting a different body. The D750 does well for wildlife, but you need to be sure to fill the frame. And that's almost impossible in most wildlife photography. If you frequently find yourself cropping, cropping to the point where the picture no longer seems sharp, this body might fix the problems for you. The Nikon D500. It's an APS-C body, 
which means all the images are cropped by like 1.5 times basically. It shoots in the center of the frame, but it's getting you more detail out of the middle of the picture. And uh, it also has a much better focusing system. So overall, this is our favorite camera body for wildlife and you'll find it'll do a lot to improve your wildlife pictures if you upgrade to this body, which is also about two grand, it's expensive. For the ultimate in wildlife, get the Nikon 600mm f4 and I think you'll be spending like 13 grand for it but it's pretty much unbeatable. It's huge, it's heavy, it's a pain to travel with but your wildlife pictures will be completely pro. I like to put the D500 on that and it's remarkable. If you're shooting some video and you want a mic, I can recommend the Sennheiser EW100 G3 or G2 mics. I'm using the G2 version right now and my throat is kind of blown but overall the mics sound great and we've been using them for years they're just workhorses they just go and go and go check them out at the link here stp.io slash g3 if you want to save some bucks um, go to ebay and search for the ew100 g2 mics which are almost as good i will say if you're thinking about buying them used though the actual microphone itself gets worn out so if somebody has been using it, you'll probably have to replace the microphone and the mics alone cost over a hundred bucks besides just the receiver and transmitter. Just something to think about. If you're thinking about buying polarizing UV and ND filters for your lenses, don't let me stop you. Go for it if that's how you work. But I do want to point out uh, a video that I have here that provides you some free alternatives. So you might still want to get those filters later on down the road. But if you go to stp.io slash no filter, I have a video that shows you how you can use software to replicate those different filters without having to actually drop the cash. Just a way to save some money if you prefer that way. If you think about making prints, here's a reference to another video, stp.io slash print it. We tested like more than a dozen different printing services in the US to find the best printing service. Mpix, like spoiler alert, we, we found Mpix to be the best. Recommend a couple of tripods. If you're looking to travel, our favorite travel tripod is the Be Free from Manfrotto. Check it out at that link. It folds up tiny and fits in your bag. If you want a heavier tripod for more serious work and you don't have to have it fold up into a tiny bag, check out this model of Manfrotto tripod at this link here. Just more heavy duty. The Nikon flashes, in my opinion, are wildly overpriced. There's a variety of different companies that make excellent third-party alternatives. The one that we like best currently only costs about a hundred bucks and it has an awesome uh, radio receiver built into it. You can check it out at this link here. It supports TTL, it supports high-speed sync. It even has like a separate rechargeable battery which is kind of superior for me at least uh, to the standard double A's that you might be using. Um, it's from a company called Godox. Godox also makes this excellent strobe which has quickly become our favorite strobe. This strobe can be wirelessly controlled from the same transmitters that will control this flash or you can use it on camera. So it's very versatile. You could use the same transmitter to control your flash and your strobe or one or the other. I love being able to switch between them like that. Um, <clears throat> we found these strobes, they're only like 500 bucks but they do a fantastic job and depending on the model you get they can even support TTL. They all support high speed sync so you can use them outside even in bright sunlight. We have a full review coming but for now you can check it out at stp.io slash fpn. These are branded Flashpoint by Adorama. These flashes I said were made by Godox. They're both made by Godox. It's just in the United States Adorama is rebranding the Godox strobes. Godox or, it doesn't have great support. So in the US, I recommend getting the Flashpoint branded strobes because Adorama will provide support and they tend to be better. Otherwise, they are absolutely identical and you could even mix Flashpoint and Godox strobes. Anyway, awesome strobes. One last plug for our books, Stunning Digital Photography teaches you all the stuff that I haven't taught you here, like not the buttons and dials, but it teaches you the art of photography, composition, lighting, timing, planning, mood, expression, storytelling, troubleshooting, fixing problems, and when and why you'd want to change your different camera settings. So check it out at Amazon Stunning Digital Photography or go to our store here and get it directly. I also teach you how to use Lightroom and Photoshop, the two most popular photo editing apps. It's a key part in making your pictures awesome. And if you have questions about gear, 
which lens is to get, what all those numbers and letters after the lens uh, name, what those actually mean. I'll teach you all of that in my photography buying guide. You can even get a kit at a discounted price to get all those books together. Subscribe for lots of free videos. If you have any follow-up questions, add a comment down below. Give me a like and don't forget to share with your friends or send them to stp.io slash tutorial. Thanks so much. Bye.